Uh, good afternoon, good evening, thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the In Health Reporting, Artificial Intelligence and Radiography, The Robots Are Coming. Uh, my name's Nick Wasnitzer, I'm a radiographer at Homerton, a clinical academic at Canterbury Christchurch University, and I'll be chairing this, uh, this evening's session. We've got some really, really great speakers, and it's a very, very topical area at the moment. I think Foddy put out the, the Twitter poll of... Where are we? Have we got enough information? Do we think it's going to improve practice, hinder practice, get rid of radiographers altogether? Who knows? But the robots are here. It's just whether how quick they're coming. So I'd like to introduce Fadi Kiriakos just to say a few words quickly. Thank you, Nick. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for so much for coming. It's a Monday evening. It's house toning outside, so apologies to drag you out on that, but thank you all so much for uh, being here. Um, we run this event uh, twice a year. We do a London event. We do one in Manchester. They're always a great uh, event for everyone to come to. We make them free to attend so that as many people as possible can, can come and enjoy it. Uh, we do this in conjunction with the Society and College uh, of Radiographers and also the British Institute of Radiology. So a big thank you to them also. Um, I wanted to make a big mention to um, Daniel and Mel from the um, BIR who are going to be running... The, uh, the, the live stream from the back. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online as well. Um, so we are streaming to somewhere in the region of a thousand people um, today. So it's, uh, it's an incredible uh, reach that we've uh, actually gone to. So we're, it's, um, we're hopeful that this topic is gonna get out there. Uh, and that topic is literally uh, artificial intelligence within radiography. And the reason I put today on and this particular subject is because um, those that do go to lots of events know that the um, subject is flogged to death. <laughs> you know, we, we hear it everywhere we go. But uh, one of the things I really wanted to do was actually get the perspective over from radiography. So what I'm hoping we're going to achieve from tonight is this opportunity for radiographers to become more involved with, uh, within AI, to become more influential within it. And one thing's for certain, you know, change healthcare is, is, is going to change the, uh, and the way we deliver healthcare is going to change. And I think radiographers need to be um, at the table, for want of a better expression, uh, when it comes to decision making. So part of that is to, is to facilitate that process today to, to get it out there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, quick one. So I did do this poll. Uh, it was interesting, actually, because the poll was literally what's people's perception of AI, specifically for radiographers. 60% uh, did say it would facilitate their role. 38% uh, said they don't know enough yet, and um, only 2% said they were concerned for the future, which is quite promise promising. And um, what I do hope is that 38% that don't know enough yet, and I think many of us are in that camp, to be honest, um, but those of us that are there, this is where it starts. You know, from, from here on in, we can really start to uh, understand a bit more about how it's going to Im impact the profession. Uh, very quick update on in-health reporting. So uh, for those that know our service, we've been an uh, on-site service for the last six years. Very pleased to announce that after a successful pilot, um, we have uh, introduced telereporting as well. So we'll be the, um, the country's only uh, on-site and remote reporting facility. At uh, any stage uh, uh, during the networking, would love to speak to people about that as well. Um, we've got our team at hand, actually. Could the team put their hands up just to show you they are? <laughs> <laughs> there we are. So if, any, um, if you do want to find out a bit more about how the telereporting works, we'd be more than happy to speak to you. Um, I think that's it. Let's it. enjoy it. Thank you so much for the speakers, and um, I hope you all, as I say, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Foddy, for welcoming us all here. And it's with pleasure I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Shree Redler. He's a consultant radiologist and I think president-elect of the British Institute of Radiology. He's going to give us uh, an introduction and an overview of radiography. Thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you, Fodi. And thanks to InHealth and uh, Society of College of Radiographers for inviting me today evening. And thanks, all of you, for coming over on, on this cold Monday evening. Uh, you can see my designation there. Um, I'm representing the BIR today, but um, in the next 15 minutes, I'll give you an overview of the AI scene in UK, uh, the government initiatives, and a few examples of uh, where AI is 
being implemented or going to be implemented in the next year or so. As you all know, X-rays have been discovered 125 years back. So we have seen some major transformations along the way. I would say the first major transformation is in the 70s and 80s when cross-section imaging took us by storm and changed the whole practice of radio radiography. And then in the 90s, the second transformation, I would call, is uh, the implementation of PACs across the globe. I know it's still variable, meaning the developed countries certainly are all more or less 100% uh, PACs um, integrated, whereas some developing countries are still a bit behind, but that's like a second major revolution or transformation in radiography. And now this I see as the third major transformation, AI. It's here to stay. Now, the big million dollar question, are the robots coming? Well, they're coming, but I don't think they'll replace us. <laughs> I mean, certainly not in the, next, in the near future. I think it will take lots more time, and I don't think it will ever replace us humans because we still need the human touch. I think AI will complement and augment the care we provide to the patients. It will probably take away some of, the, some of the mundane tasks and let us deal with the patients, spend time with the patients. That's how I see AI uh, helping us. It will probably act as a, well, most certainly act as a second reader, and it will probably act as a third eye for us, um, for the radiographers and radiologists. It will definitely be the third eye. Um, coming to the AI scene, as you all know, there are hundreds of startups all, ac all across the globe and tens of startups coming up in the UK on a, on a, almost on a, if not daily basis, weekly basis. And they're all vying with each other, the smaller uh, startups vying with the big, well-established players, the big, the big groups. And countries like the USA and Israel are way ahead in this. They have quite a, hundreds of companies. And we are not far behind, along with the China, which is another major player in this field. You have two types of initiatives, the government-funded initiatives, but also the industry-led projects. But the most important thing is we should be working together. Otherwise, we'll just be going in parallel. We should be working together, get both the groups together to work for us, radiographers, radiologists. So that's very important. That's my single biggest message, actually. If we don't get involved in this now, I think we'll get lost. And they will just lead the way. They meaning, what I mean to say is, uh, the industry or the government, they will just uh, impose on us what they're developing. Now, just a few background of the NHS initiatives over the last few years, uh, which will have an impact on the field of AI. NHS Digital was set up 2013, seven, more than seven years back. Uh, sponsored by the Department of Health and Social Care. Uses IT to improve healthcare. That's the uh, premise of this uh, organization. It collects, processes, and publishes data, and uses this to improve the healthcare system in UK. I mean, a few examples of uh, the initiatives taken by NHS Digital are the NHS email we all use, the e-prescribing, and then also the um, the choose and book, how patients can book into clinic appointments. All these are NHS Digital initiatives. And moving on from there, just last year, exactly a year back, the health secretary has uh, announced this, NHSX. It's a new organization for digital and data in bold and technology. So this was set up only a year back to bring the benefits of modern technology to various uh, um, healthcare groups, and which should benefit both patients and the clinicians and the clinical staff as a whole. So they want, the main aim is to bring the NHS and the industry together in developing these technologies and uh, also make the whole workforce in the NHS digital ready. That's a big thing. Developing technology is one thing, but also quite a few of us in the room, I presume, including me, are not that digital savvy, digitally savvy. So we need to be prepared to, uh, and be ready when these new algorithms uh, come into force. They, they, and, and, and AI is the new buzzword, obviously, so the NHSX is set up with AI in mind. And a new document was released only a few months back, October, or four months back, uh, which sets out the plan, basically. And uh, this was released by the Department of Health and uh, Health and so Social Care in uh, conjunction with NHS England, NHS Improvement. So all this came together and produced this 100-plus page document. I'm not telling you to read it, but if you have, get a chance, just skim through it. There are a few important points which uh, were given in the document. Uh, and uh, the first and foremost is, this is to decrease the burden. Well, they say 
This is to decrease the burden on the clinical staff, you and me, people like you and me, by uh, using technology to improve um, or to get rid of the mundane tasks, which I'll come to in a minute. We have so many day-to-day -day tasks which technology can help us with so that we don't need to spend so much time on those things and concentrate more on patient care and thereby improving, improving patient safety in a way. So, and also, this particular document also says how to access clinical information in a safe manner. So, I mean, this is just the gist, but the document, as I said, gives some examples of good practices across the, across the country. So you should look at it like a bedtime reading. And one of the points I picked up from that document is it aims to tackle the black box nature of the digital healthcare applications. So some of these applications just fly over our, over our heads, actually. So it tries to tackle the black box nature and provides clarity to patients, to users, and regulators on how these algorithms work. And also provides clarity on the strengths and limitations. Not all, not all algorithms are great. I mean, some of them have limitations, so we just need to be aware of those things. That's the most important thing. And explain to the patients what are the strengths, what are the limitations of this particular algorithm and its methodology and ethical, ethical implications as well, and who is responsible, all these things. There's so much, so much uh, to be answered. And this document goes some way in answering some of those questions. And also we need reassurance that the AI software we are going to use is properly tested and before we introduce into clinical practice. Good or bad, luckily in the UK we have lots of regulations. I know some of, some of, sometimes it finds like we have to go through lots of loose and holes, but I think it's good in a way, because we don't introduce anything until it's properly tested. And all these agencies, I'm not going to list them out, but all these agencies are there, which will have an over, overview of all these new practices being implemented in clinical, our day-to-day -day clinical lives, basically. And also, to add to this, the government also announced this new AI lab and uh, put aside 250 million pounds towards this. I mean, the aim of this lab is to develop and adapt technologies uh, most promising in the field of medical, in the, in the medical field. But you should, you should at least have one or three of these points if you want to get to your funding. Improve patient outcomes, better patient experience, or increase service, effic service efficiency. So you need to tick these boxes if you're applying for this funding. Otherwise, you'll go nowhere. So these three points are very important, and also, these technologies which are developed by the industry should be tested in the NHS context. No point in testing this in the labs. We should test, it, test them in real life and real clinical scenarios. That's very important. And finally, gather evidence of accuracy, efficiency, and, the, and value for money. That's very important. In the NHS, which is start for cash, always. Now coming to just a bit more about AI. I told you about the NHS and give background about it. Uh, as you all know, data is the new oil or the new energy, whatever you call it in AI. So how do we use it? First and foremost, we need to have clean data because uh, data can be corrupt as well, meaning you can have lots of uh, um, variances in the data. But luckily in UK, NHS is one of the biggest databases in the world. We follow protocols, we follow certain things and all those things. Now I think we start to gain from that. I think the next speakers will probably elaborate on that. So we have very good data in the NHS which we can use to our advantage. And, and the algorithms we develop should be practical to use and also vendor neutral. I'm stressing vendor neutral because that's very important. Various vendors are developing various algorithms. And if one vendor develops something, they can't hold tight to the chest. We should be able to use those, whatever system you're using in our hospital, those algorithms should be easily applied to those systems. Uh, whatever company <coughs> produces the algorithm. That's one thing which is very important, I think. And these systems should be, well, so these algorithms should be seamlessly integrated into any imaging system we have in our hospitals to make it more practical. And once, yeah, moving to the next stage now, AI and imaging in particular. I look at it in under two headings, upstream AI and downstream AI. The upstream AI, which is what I mentioned earlier, the day-to-day -day mundane tasks, the workflow, scheduling, protocols, quality assessment, dose modulation, all this will come into upstream AI. Simple, to, simple wins. <coughs> A couple of other things which you should be aware is the big um, noise some of the companies are making is about low dose examinations and faster acquisition times. And some of the AI companies are already um, selling this. 
In fact, one company I spoke to in the recent RSNS said, uh, just, they, they just gave an example. Normally, it takes 4.5 minutes to get a T1 weighted sequence in MRI. They said we can get equal quality images for less than half that time, <clears throat> two minutes something. So if it's really true, we are onto a winner. So I think we should embrace this. But before we embrace, obviously, we need to validate if it's really true or not. But so this, I think that's very important, actually. Those upstream AI probably quick win in the next year or so. And finally, reporting templates for radiologists. That can be integrated with the, the systems by using AI. Downstream AI is the actual machine learning part of AI, where the algorithms are developed to help us, to help the reporting radiographers and the radiologists in our day-to-day -day job. Uh, they can be used as primary or secondary reader. And also, moving ahead, we might use it to characterize disease as well, which I'll, which I'll explain to you a bit more, I mean, on another slide, actually. Um, and moving on to AI and machine learning in imaging, what's very important is the data analysts and the computer scientists should be working with the, the professionals to develop these algorithms. So all these are equally important. Radiologists, radiographers, the physicists, the IT technicians, we all should be working together to develop these algorithms. Some of these are already in use. We may not know it, we may not realize, but we are already using some of these in our day-to-day -day practice. CAD, we've been using CAD for a few years now. I mean, those of you who are doing CT colons, you should be knowing about CAD. And also CAD for lung nodules. Then 3D segmentation. And VR, I mean, most hospitals now are 100% VR now. And that's also a form of AI. So already in use. Now, AI, now in near future. This is what I told about uh, the upstream AI. I think that's already being used in some areas, and some areas I think will be developed in the next year. So I think this is very important, to, for a, as I said, for a quick win. And also, we can use it to flag up critical findings, which will uh, uh, enable us to arrive at a prompt, timely diagnosis for the patient, thereby increasing patient safety. And there are endless possibilities moving ahead. Uh, as I said, AI can be used as a second reader, can minimize errors uh, in reports, assist residents in their learning and research, and also the last uh, heading there. It's quite not there yet, but that's the future I see, radiomics and radiogenomics. And just to give you an example, well, not sorry, just to elaborate on that just briefly, radiomics is we use the algorithms to identify imaging features which can characterize disease and thereby giving the prognosis and the therapeutic response. I mean, one example is texture analysis. If you pick up a lesion on, on, uh, in the lung, for example, on CT, we look at the texture, the density, the configuration, the morphology, and based on that, we can characterize the disease, probably guess, the, uh, well, not guess, but you know, the machine, the AI uh, algorithm will give a prognosis, and also moving ahead, therapeutic response as well. And the next stage is radiogenomics which is probably another 10 years down the line. But all that will be linked to the gen genomic data to potentially improve uh, the accuracy of clinical outcomes for this patient treatment. But that's, I think, another 5 to 10 years down the line. A few examples. I'll not go into detail because we're running out of time. But uh, a few examples of AI applications which will affect you and us, but which are probably being implemented across the world now, actually, in some areas. Chest X-rays, there are quite a few reporting radiographers here, chest X-rays. I think AI is very useful in two ways. In the, de in the developing countries, or third world countries, which uh, I don't like to call, but developing countries, where there's a shortage of radiologists, and where certain diseases are highly prevalent, we can use AI to actually diagnose the condition. I mean, the AI is given a binary task. Some of the African and Asian countries, is there TB or not? We do lots of TB screening there. And as long as we train the machine to uh, tell is there TB or not, that's a big, big thing. Because some of these x-rays are not reported for weeks. So by, doing the, by, by diagnosing that straight away, we can alert the concerned team. And patients can be treated promptly and save many lives. Coming to the developed countries, say for example UK, we're short of radiographers and radiologists. The backlogs in some hospitals. So AI can be used to prioritize the work and triage, OK? So that's the difference between these two worlds, actually. So I mean, I know of hospitals which where uh, X-rays have been, have been reported for a month or two months, something like that. 
not in my hospital, by the way. So, uh, so, uh, so I think AI there will definitely help in, uh, by, by picking up the positive x-rays and bring it top of the pile, and at least you can report them first. Just, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this is another area which is already being implemented, uh, CAD, but uh, what AI can do is, can characterize the nodules. Also, it helps with the follow-up of nodules. This is one of the most boring aspects of uh, reporting, follow-up of lung nodules. So AI can hopefully help us, not just giving the size, but the volume, and also giving what next. It can say, look, scan in three months, six months, or forget it, whatever it is. So AI can actually help in that way. And also, I mean, some tests have shown that it is 95% accurate, which I think is uh, probably equal or better than humans. So I think that's one area where AI can be implemented straight away. And also with lung screening coming into effect now, AI has a big role to play. Breast screening is another area. And there are a couple of projects going on, uh, not more than a couple actually, going on around the country. And this is one project in Scotland where they have a big population, 250,000 women each year, invited on screening. They two, take two views. So over a three-year period, it's 600,000 images, I gather. So we need two people to report them, be it a radiologist or a reporting mammographer. So AI can replace one of them because there's a shortage, once again, of this, uh, of this precious workforce. So AI can actually replace one of them. And uh, I mean, I, this is a complicated diagram, but the gist is clinicians will identify what challenges to give to the AI team or the computer scientists. Then they develop an algorithm. Once the algorithm is uh, validated, it is uh, uh, fed back into the system, which we're calling the clinical cockpit. And then uh, um, that's the clinical cockpit there. So what happens? The clinical cockpit is just a PAX workstation. You have the AI algorithms sitting behind. And you also have the EPR, electronic patient record. So this is how the feature will look like. Everything into in one big workstation with the AI seamlessly integrated. And with the click of a button, we should be able to use AI and the EPR. I know it's a dream at the moment, but still, this is how I see it in the future, how we see it in the future, a critical cockpit wherein we, wherein we can access everything in a single workstation and use the technology available. And finally, just another example uh, before I conclude, neuroimaging is, is another area where you are, uh, reporting radiographers, radiologists can use AI for the benefit of patients. We can use the e-aspects tool. I think you must be aware of e-aspects. That is Alberta score program, early CT score, which is used for stroke, ischemia, ischemic stroke. So there's a new tool which uh, AI has uh, developed, which, is, which can diagnose this stroke by mapping the brain. And this will assist the clinicians to initiate prompt treatment. So this can be done once the AI is, employ, uh, is used for, this patient, for these patients. Uh, the radiographers or the radiologists can have a, use a second read and uh, inform the clinicians straight away. And also AI tools can pick up acute bleed. And once again, we can alert the clinicians. So various applications of AI, which are being implemented or will be implemented in the next near future. And the, f the future I see is we should be working with AI. Both radiographers and radiologists should be working with AI for a brighter and better future. Thank you. tonight with us. I would like to thank FODI and InHealth for the invite and the uh, Society and College of Radiographers and Deputies in Radiology for hosting this event. I am the Postgraduate Program Director and Doctor Program Lead uh, for Radiography at City University of London and um, I am invited to talk about the role of AI in radiography education and offer an academic perspective. Um, I would like to say that AI is uh, a disruptive technology, a disruptive in many ways, because it's, not, it's unlike any other technology we have seen before. It's not like the uh, three Tesla scanners, it's not like the uh, faster city scanners. It's a technology that learns as you feed it with data. So this is why we are here tonight, because it's so unique compared to all the other technologies our field, medical imaging, has experienced in the last 50 years. 
I would like to see us as a profession uh, which is around for helping others in the community. And we have, uh, we base radiography practice, clinical education and research in three pillars. One is patient safety. We don't want to do any harm while we do um, our, while we go about our practice. The other one is image quality, and this is what we strive for every day. And also patient care and patient centeredness of any examination. So I would like to think that these are the three pillars of who we are. When AI came in, uh, and as we learn more about it, I, I think we all go through an identity crisis. Who are we, and what will the future hold for our profession? And this is what is going to define how we learn about AI and with AI. This um, word cloud is a word cloud I have asked my students, my uh, undergraduate students in year three, to answer a question about what are their top three values as radiographers. And you can see here things like loyalty, honesty come up, but also helping others. So it's quite important, and caring on the side, it's quite important to understand that we are there, we are here for the patients. So no matter how many technologies will change, we are here for them. And then you have the hype of AI. So five years ago, all the conferences were about big data. And now, naturally, you need to have someone to analyze reliably and safely this big data. And AI actually comes in very timely to fill in this gap. It might have different names, and there's a lot of taxonomy about AI. The, the truth is, whatever you call it, it's disrupting workflows in an unprecedented way we haven't seen before. And as a profession, we, are, we know about changes in practice, changes in technology, and we kind of used at adapting, constantly learning and relearning um, our terminologies, our physics, to adjust to the new techniques and the new methodologies. But AI, as I said, is a, is a new thing, to the extent that we had to have the topple review to explain how can this be learned from the healthcare professionals in order to have an efficient healthcare system in the future, in the future with AI. I'm sure you're all familiar with the topple review, which was published in February 2019. This is about preparing the healthcare workforce to deliver the digital future. So in this Topol review, some of the things that um, Eric Topol discussed was about creating um, master's degrees exactly about AI to accommodate and absorb the new knowledge and prepare the healthcare professionals for that reason. He also said that it's very important to try and increase the number of hours as we work on algorithms and computing and also redesign the undergraduate curriculum for healthcare professionals to adjust to this new reality. So there are some really nice suggestions in here that we as academics, uh, we need to take and carry forward. So there's a lot of identity crisis in terms of moving forward with AI, and many of us are now rethinking, what will the future hold? We will become radiographers, we will be radiographers, we will retain this identity, where we will become all, in a different sort of uh, term, data scientists for different modalities. I have some, some messages for everyone who's listening is present. I think we ought to learn from other relevant disciplines like medicine, because they are some years ahead, the other healthcare professionals, in terms of ad adjusting and ad adopting AI. And you can see here, this is a paper uh, uh, talking about the importance of having AI and robot robotics forming an integral part of the curriculum for medical students. And many of the big uh, universities, like Cleveland Clinic and Harvard, they already, MIT, they already incorporate AI in their medical curricula. As you can see here, there's another paper about artificial intelligence in medical education, talking about the importance of integrating AI into medicine into many different ways, which I'm going to explain later on. And many more papers about reimagining medical clinical education in the AI era. So what can we learn from medicine? Artificial intelligence will have an impact on all professions, not just medical professions, uh, including those in medicine and medical education, but also radiography. Current experiments in AI indicate that the teacher's role is crucial to try and introduce the AI and 
and pave the way for a, a proper use of this technology. The result of AI in medicine will not be to replace the doctor or the practitioner, but to replace and enhance many of the practitioner's roles and create a range of new roles amongst those data scientists. It's crucial that these changes uh, will be known in advance, so we know we, ca we can highlight as academics what lies ahead so that medical education can begin preparing medical students and, and radiography students for these new roles. I would like to say that it's quite, it's quite nice to hear all the time about AI in radiology. And I've been in many conferences in the last three years, and I've always, go, I've always gone on the front keeping notes. But I think it's time we shift the discussions to radiography. So with everyone's uh, approval, I'm going to change the word here to radiography. So I would like to see more of that coming out. There's only two papers currently uh, that speak about the impact of AI and radiography, and I would like to see more of these because this is not difficult to do. We just have to, to work towards that. And I know that all the professional bodies, the society and college, the, uh, the British Radiology as well, they are having work plans, which is currently working to produce this kind of paper. So it's not that we are lagging behind, but we're just working on the background. Uh, this is one paper from Australia. This, this is actually the first paper that discussed AI in radiography. This is from Professor Sarah Lewis from the group of Professor Patrick Brennan in Australia. I'm not sure if there's anyone streaming from Australia at the moment, but it's from the University of Sydney when they have identified roles for radiographers in AI, and we have to teach about these roles, and we have to prepare the workforce for these roles. So there are things in, for instance, image segmentation, as you can see here, there are different areas of image registration, but also for high, uh, for leading the quality issues, patient positioning, image acquisition, so all of these areas are areas we can work on as radiographers. Then there comes the other paper that I'm sure it was the most downloaded paper from the British Journal of Radiology this year by Professor Marianne Hardy and Dr. Hugh Harvey, uh, who discussed uh, in the UK context for the very first time about artificial intelligence and diagnostic imaging and the impact of the profession. Again, similarly highlighting areas and roles of AI and radiography. And we, as academics, we have to teach about these areas and about these roles. Roles about acquisition, uh, even about post-processing, positioning the patients, even vetting the examination at the beginning. So we have to learn from medicine. We have to identify roles in AI and teach about them. We also have to apply for funding. Uh, I'm very grateful to the speaker just before me who discussed about different initiatives of the government. But I think as researchers, we have to bring in research income. We have to actually use this research income to uh, to, for the priorities, for the research priorities for the profession, and to help shape practice for the future. So the English NHS has allocated one billion to AI research implementation, including goal of cutting cancer deaths by 10 percent, 22,000 lives per year by 2035. There's a dozen, dozen review about um, automation, which could release a lot of money of the NHS budgets towards these these uh, sources. There's also EPSSC funding, MRC funding. And many doctorates, over 12 centers of excellence at this point, and I'm, I'm sure this is going to increase. And I want to mention that also 50% of AI healthcare startups are currently in the UK, although we are not leading on the AI developments because our uh, counterparts in China and the US are actually far ahead, and we can also <coughs> learn from them. We are actually having the most startups uh, in this area. Also, as, as a suggestion, I think we need to work with absolutely everyone. And by everyone, I mean, first of all, with the patients, because this is for them, it's not for us. With clinical practitioners, because they have the questions and we hope to provide the answers. With the industry, because I, I think I am getting really fed up with looking at the industry um, running after the radiologists only, because we have many things to say and we need to be listened and discussed with them. So. Radiography is open, and anyone from the industry who might be listening, we should be teaming up much more in the future. With professional bodies, uh, the Society and College and BIR, of course, they're leading their way in developments and, and policy and practice. 
other uh, higher education institutions, so it's not like um, a competitive field, we have to work together to combine our expertise and our knowledge. Other disciplines, so radiography, radiology, physics, computer scientists, we all have a share of this new field and we all need to work together to conceptualize it and understand it. And also, why not devise a national plan for AI research in healthcare where everyone has a role and where everyone can contribute from their perspective? I mean, in Australia, they have an international planning on AI and they bring in this setup different partners from different countries to fulfill their national goals and gain expertise from other countries as well. So it's, it's a very big puzzle and we need to have a lot of manpower into that. So what can you practically do to integrate AI into radiography education and the curriculum? I would say one idea is to try and create introductory modules to AI. This is probably easier because it can integrate into the curriculum in a much easier pace and way. And you can slowly introduce difficult concepts like algorithms, for instance, at undergraduate or postgraduate level. Run workshops on AI with the help of computer scientists and engineers and physics, physicists, uh, but ensure the curriculum is adjusted for clinical practitioners. We are not all fond of numbers. We're not all fond of coding. Intercalate, and this is one of the things that some of the papers suggested. So intercalating means that you have something like a sandwich mo module or term or year, like in medicine, where you do another subject. So we could be intercalating a term on AI dedicated for this one, where we can discuss and do things like validation, translation to practice, QA of AI, and other concepts. Encourage the students to engage in undergraduate or postgraduate dissertation projects on AI and radiography. So things like variations across disciplines of radiography, uh, roles, validation, or ethics. Ensure you create the opportunities for and supervise PhD AI research to create the necessary evidence base for the profession and for healthcare practice. We don't know yet what AI mean, means for us. We just have to research it. Raise awareness and allow people to interact and discuss about topics, challenges, and solutions relating to AI. Um, and this is the best way to try and get brainstorming and get everyone working together in this, in this field. The field will evolve further, so please watch this space. These are just some ideas for now. In the next five years, the field will be totally different, and we will have to readjust our thinking. So what should new curricula <coughs> include? This is from um, a paper on medical education, so they should include the four different areas. Knowledge capture, not knowledge retention. Collaboration with and management of AI applications. A better understanding of probabilities and how to apply them meaningfully in clinical decision making with patients and families. And the cultivation of empathy and compassion. Where all discussion is about AI, EI, emotional intelligence, has a very big role in these discussions as well. So academic topics that one might need to consider for modules or masters or anything related to AI in radiography education might include clinical examples of AI applications, great diversity and variability. I believe uh, Jackie Matthew is, is in the audience. She's somewhere there, yes. And Jackie is an amazing clinical practitioner and researcher on fetal MRI and ultrasound who is actually practicing AI every day with all her might. Ethics of AI, accountability in the case of mistakes, understand not just in reporting, but also in general radiography practice, like positioning, data acquisition, data analysis. What is patient acceptability of this new technology? How much would they trust it and like it if they know their breast mammogram is, is actually assessed and viewed by um, a computer? Validation of AI tools into translation to practice, impact on workflows like the backlogs, waiting times, and staff shortages might make that necessary. Patient-centered care and precision medicine. How can we use the time we save from AI in to make it much more patient-centered? And also emotional intelligence, resilience, compassion fatigue, and burnout. All of these are important, not just for transition to practice, but for actually surviving clinical practice every day. And now with AI, they have become more important than ever. 
So is this actually important, patient-centered care in the era of AI? Is this relevant? It will be much more relevant to discuss patient-centered care in relation to AI. As a use of AI, it will free up time to customize the examination for every patient, speak with our patients, and most importantly, listen to them and listen to their needs and adjust the examinations to suit them better. I just bring this quote from uh, a paper Reimagining Medical Education in the Age of AI on the American Medical Journal of Ethics. Um, the importance of the human touch. So nothing, I'm just going to try and read, sorry. Uh, it's necessary to say that machines cannot and should not replace human doctors. The same counts for a doctor, but for any healthcare professional. The role of the doctor will inevitably evolve over time, but doctors will not become obsolete. Humans will always be required to interpret outputs from machines, assess ethical and value-based dilemmas, and communicate empathetically. The therapeutic relationship between doctor and patient and the fundamental tenets of medicine will remain so. There is no substitute for the human touch. We touch the patients every day when we position them for radiography, and nobody else can do that. So, in terms of rethinking radiographic curriculum in relation to AI, some much more ambitious concepts might be about the impact the new learning might have on the modules, topics, duration of our bachelor's degrees and master's programs. Would there be an apprenticeship on AI for healthcare practitioners? That would be a nice idea. Could AI become advanced practice for radiography? Imagine that. So, if someone is going to be, uh, in this particular area, consultant AI radiographer, for instance. Will there be bespoke undergraduates and master's programs for clinicians? Will we all become data scientists in one way or another in the end? Will we be choosing AI or patient-centered care direction in the future if we want to go into this profession? These are questions I cannot answer really, but these are very valid questions for the next five to ten years. In conclusion, I would like to say that as academics in academia, through education and research, we will have to become the agents of change for a future with AI, because it's already here. We need to foster strong clinical academic and industry academic partnerships with support. So the clinicians have the questions. We hope to provide the answers as researchers. There has to be cross-discipline collaborations and cross-university collaborations, which are very important to try and make progress and bring all the minds together. The professional bodies will need to engage in these initiatives as they do and maintain that to create policy in the future. Everything has to be with the patient in mind because it will have to serve them before it serves us. I would like to thank you very much. I would like to say that I, I'm not here to advocate different things. We are already doing many of the things I said today at City University. We have new modules. We have students engaging in dissertations, undergraduate, postgraduate level. We have a new PhD starting in September, uh, funded by InHealth, and I'm very grateful to the support we get to try and make this agenda and push it forward. Uh, and we have events relating to AI where we bring together all the key stakeholders, students, clinical partners, research collaborators, industry, the bodies, professional bodies, to try and make, understand what this holds for us in the future and adjust accordingly our curricula. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I have the uh, unenviable task of trying to explain a policy statement, which is, uh, when, and when you follow two very thought-provoking speakers who give you the sense that, you know, we, we could well be entering one of the most exciting phases of imaging and oncology 
that we've ever seen. Okie dokie. So, what is driving AI? Well, it's everywhere, isn't it? Everywhere you look. Driverless cars, stock market control, imaging, oncology. I mean, it, it, it really is everywhere. Mainly driven, I guess, by a sense that there are real business opportunities here. There's been mentioned by both previous speakers about startup companies. They see this as the new gold rush. So it's a very exciting time. You know, there, there are basic things like the cost of computing power. We all, we're all familiar with that, and Moore's law, etc. But the cost of things is coming down, so everything is becoming more achievable. So smaller companies have the potential to, to really develop very good, uh, useful AI systems very relatively cheaply. Christine has already talked about the research potential. Sri's already talked about this fantastic, you know, what could be in imaging and oncology. But we mustn't get too caught up in the hype in a way, because sometimes you, you are led to believe that really AI is the answer to everything. And, and there's a lovely phrase called technological utopianism. And it's, it's, it doesn't matter, you know, all our problems will be sorted out by AI at some point. And if you look back through, through history, you, you, you would have seen, you know, when they first came out with the computer, there was this, this belief that the world would only need three computers, and that would handle all our data flows. We live in a crazy world. AI has the potential to reduce workloads, manage workflows, report all images. Could it? I'm not so sure. Christina talked a lot about the, the human touch. That is something which will never be lost. We're still always going to need that. But at the moment, it's, it's all, as I said, it's the new Klondike, so business cases are being written everywhere because there's um, a belief that there's going to be all these benefits in the future. Now, obviously, with, with the, there's always risks and challenges, aren't there? There's always been that. When we had CT scanners, the risk there was about dose, and you know, now we, we've had to approach that in a slightly different way. But GDPR, and I've been informed tonight that GDPR is no longer law in the UK. Did you know that? It's, we should now call it DPA 2018. GDPR is a European thing. So, who can sense their images? Who, who owns images? Who owns data? Patient? Hospital, maybe? The data is owned by the Secretary of State, or, and it's devolved to, in the different countries. So, if the, if, if, if the Secretary of State owns the data, then perhaps they can use it how they see fit, and maybe use, give it to startups to develop algorithms that can then be sold back to the NHS for profit. Seem, doesn't seem right somehow, does it? There will also be legal challenges. Automation, blanket decision making. Where it's banned in certain sectors. Because of the worry about, you know, systems being uncontrolled. Should healthcare be different? There's been talk a lot about upstream and downstream AI prioritization of patient workflows. They've got to be right, haven't they? Because if you were waiting and uh, you, you were kept being put off because the AI algorithm said, you, you're not that important, you've got to keep going back down the list, you know, you might want to challenge that. And the key one is responsibility. Just imagine, right, so something goes wrong downstream on that image interpretation. Maybe a flag 
is failed to be added to that image. If that ends up in court, who is responsible? The programmer, the radiographer, the radiologist, the institution, the PACS manager? It's a lot of things that really have yet to be sorted out. Now we get to the, you know, the statement. Why do we need to make a policy statement? And really, there, there they are. We have to have a view on influence and indirect improvements to, so that the new technology, when it's implemented, is implemented correctly and to support a safe and ethical practice. Seems reasonable. So what we try to do with the statement is actually be, be quite practical in how we apply it. So I'm taking these, there are, there are 12 objectives. I've grouped some of them together so that you know, I don't bore you to tears. Um, but supporting members' education. We, we, you, we, as, as a professional body, you can't, you can't do everything for people, you know? There has to be, we have to get people interested, we have to give people the opportunities to train. We have to sort of set the scene for people, but individuals have to sort of really get to grips with it and, 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 and take it forward. Now, we do publish some things on AI, and you could argue that we, we don't do as much as maybe the RCR do. And that, you know, that's a, probably a valid, valid criticism. Uh, there is uh, the 140 million funding to promote a AI, and we've actually, we've actually got a seat on that group, so we will have um, a voice in how that money is, is, is uh, allocated. And we're trying to get, and I, this is another example here, AI and Pediatric uh, Radiology Survey, trying to get people to engage with us on AI. I've grouped this three together here because uh, for those of you who are not aware, we have a radiographic uh, informatics group. We're a, we're a small group. I, I, I sort of um, am the officer responsible for that, but it's a member-led group. All of our special interest groups are member-led. And we've had a lot of um, discussions about AI because it was something that, that, that I think both speakers touched on this, that, that AI is a different world. You've got to learn new, new, a new language, deep learning, machine learning, you know, that sort of thing. And how are algorithms, how do they work? What's inside the black box? I, I was lucky enough to come to the BIR conference uh, in January, and there were two computer scientists giving talks. And I'm sure they dumbed down their talk really incredibly. They must have thought, well, we're, we're going to talk to a bunch of five-year-olds, so we'll really dumb this talk down. It was up there. <laughs> you know, so it, it's a challenging thing to get your head around. But so what, we, what we've been trying to say is we need, we need to make sure that, that the people who are on our radiographic informatics group have the knowledge to understand what's inside the black box, what AI can do, and, we, and, and we're always looking for people to work with us. So if you've got a real interest you know, in, in AI, then, then we are the people to speak to. But it is about having expertise within the profession, but also communicating that expertise. Again, it's been mentioned uh, this evening that you know, th this is not a uni-professional domain. This, this is a big challenge for us all, and I think we, we have to work collaborati collaboratively. I'll talk a little bit more about what, what, what we're doing in, in that field, but you know, I'm, I'm talking about the BIR, the RCR, uh, and other AHP groups, because we forget about the other AHP groups. You know, we, we just think, you know, imaging, AI is for us, isn't it? It's for imaging and oncology. But there are, there, there are um, p uh, physiotherapy colleagues, there are occupational therapy colleagues, who, who are just really, they're entering this digital world at a pace. So we need to be working with them as well, because it, when, you, when you boil it all down, what are we doing if we're doing it for patient benefit, aren't we? 
research, 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 isn't it? That's what, that's what we should be talking about. I know Christine is passionate about this, and my, my colleague uh, Rachel Harris is equally as passionate about this, and we really do need to step up to the mark here and start to, to get people involved in, in uh, AI research. Because the world is changing. The, everything is now going to be data-driven. We have to understand. A couple of, a couple of years ago, I was at, I was at um, UKRC, as it was then, and there was a, there was a, a great talk given by, uh, by a... He, he was a, a graduate trainee, so he was, he was on the, the management course, and, he, and he, he had all this data, and he said, we, we, you've got, we've got this data, and it's fantastic, and, and it shows that we should not be doing these examinations. What do you think happened? Nothing, <laughs> you know, because it was, a, it was a private bit of research he was doing, and, and we, need, we need to change the way we work by using research. That's why we got people like Christina. Yes, professional education and career framework. We're on the case. We are on that. That is in development right now. Because, and it, it's, it's not just something we decided to do in embarrassment for tonight. Um, it's, 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 it's something we've been, it takes so long to do, and we have to get it right. But we are working, you know, what do our undergrads need? What do our postgrad people need? Because we, if, if we don't get that right, we have no voice. We have no voice at all. And we don't want that. Yeah, okay, HCPC, yeah, we'll do that. Skip over that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I'm, I'm reading it, you can tell, can't you? Um, yeah, opportunity. They, we, all, all evening we've been talking about opportunities. And, and we, we've got to get, we, yeah, we've got to get, we should be excited by this. But whatever we do has to be done safely and has to be done in the patient interests. And it has to be, the data has to be secure. And it's, it's interesting when you talk about data security because then you talk about, well, is, it, is this a level playing field across the world? And the answer is no. So, we've been here before, haven't we? And, I, and I've, I've, I'm also uh, citing the same uh, paper. <laughs> you can tell there's not that many papers out there. Um, we have been here before. I mean, we, we, we adapt, don't we? We adapt. New technology comes along, we adapt to it. We use it. We, we, we take ownership of it. This AI is a big thing to take ownership of. I'm not sure we can take ownership of it all, but we can certainly work with, with colleagues to, 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 make it, to make it the best it can be. This, this is also from uh, the same paper. And I put this up because, I, you know, I, I, you could argue there's a point here. They've got a point here. We've been relatively quiet. If you look around, if you look at the, the, the papers that have been produced at the, in the United States and China, when you look to the UK, the radiologists, in all fairness to them, have, have, are doing... A, really pushing this. They're pushing it with their more senior members, but they're also pushing it with their trainees really heavily. And that can only be a good thing. And we, we have to start thinking the same way. Now, I, I can't talk, I, can't, I just can't talk about a policy statement all night. Give, you know, give me a break. I've got, to say, I've got to throw something in to make you, uh, to stimulate you and make you, make you ask questions later. So, uh, Eric Topple has, has already been, been mentioned, and, um, and, he, he, it, and he was interviewed by, in, by Healthcare IT News about his, this book. And, and, he, and you can see he, he's, he's worried. We talked about DPA 2018, not GDPR. And for some, that is seen as a bit of an obstacle to development. Although my colleague Malcolm McNinch, who sat in the second row there, would argue it's not the case, and it's, it's, it's helps and it's beneficial.
but sometimes, you know, we do think that we are, you know, getting that clean data that Sri, Sri mentioned is quite difficult to get. Whereas abroad, in, in, particularly in China, China have got an ambition to be the leaders in AI by 2030. Some people think they're already there. So the algorithms we could be using down the line could well be coming, being imported. Makes you think, doesn't it? Eric Topol also went on to say this, because I, again, I talked about technological utopianism. And he, this is particularly looking at the United States healthcare system. And he's, you know, for all that money they're investing in AI, they're not getting the basics right in a lot of instances. So we mustn't lose sight of that. We still, you know, everything we do has to be, has to be done through the lens of improving patient care and making it safe. But Eric Topol said, there's a remedy out there. AI can help, not replace, but help service delivery. It's out there dangling. We just gotta go and get it and make it happen. So I said this was gonna be practical. And what, what does this mean for the, for the SCOR? I've already talked about this need to get people within the organization comfortable with, with talking about AI and, and fully understand what that is, what's inside the black box. But at this moment, companies are working, you know, again, with, with our radiology colleagues, Understandably, they, 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 they are, they're playing a blinder in, in many instances here. Uh, I, there was a talk given at the last BIR conference here where the, 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 the director of the Imaging Academy in Wales said that 20% of all of the uh, trainee radio, radiologists were currently working with startup companies. 20%, that will only in, increase. We should, we should have that same mentality. We should have more, more radiographers involved in those projects. Because we, you know, we have something to give to. I'm not saying you know, we should be working with the radiologists to do this. But again, whatever we do, Remember the third bullet point. We are the defender of patient rights. There's a lot of talk about data, data selling, data being a commodity. It worries a lot of people. And so, and so it should. So we need to improve member engagement. Now, the thing is, the, I think a bit of a problem we've got here is that the... the there's only so, so much space in the calendar. And uh, Sri's, uh, you know, a, a, big, a big player in, in the BIR, and they've sort of cornered, I, should, I shouldn't say you, because uh, I'm on the group as well. You know, we, <laughs> we've cornered certain parts of the calendar now, which are really... They're, they're sort of belong to their BIR, and they belong to them because they're, they're really good conferences. The uh, big data conference in November every year, I'm, I'm assuming we're gonna run that this year, which again gives you a completely different perspective on healthcare. And the artificial uh, intelligence in practice for 2021, that'll probably be January, uh, the two-day event that was held here in January was absolutely fantastic. And there's no point replicating that. You can, you can, you can deliver it to an, a, a radiographer audience in a different way. But, you know, earlier on we were talking about collaborating, and I would encourage you, try to come to the, the BIR uh, Conferences, they're, they're very, very good. And also the BIR, and now, I, I sound like I'm, I'm selling the BIR membership here. I can see Charlotte, Charlotte, uh, my, my, my boss Charlotte's at the back, and she sort of staggers at me. Um, 
but the BIR and the Chinese Society of Radio Radiology, they're going to publish a special uh, pu publication. Again, because the, the Chinese are really out there. They're really leading on this. And again, our colleagues from the RCR, again, they've cornered their bit of the market there with artificial intelligence and clinical practice, which will be very professional, I've no doubt. Where do we go? What, do the, what does the SCOR do? I hear you ask. Right. Cut through the hype. What works? What would be beneficial? I think we need lots of research on that, but we need to have really, as, as a profession, we need to have real serious discussions about that. I can't emphasize the second bullet point more. It, it is about education. Education, education, education. Where, do, where have you heard that before? Um, but it's really important. And we have to do our bit. Can't do everything, and, but our, our, the way we can do that is, is through informing our members through our publications, encouraging research. Uh, my colleague Alex Peck run, uh, organizes a national PAX training course uh, through learnpacks.com, and, and, and there's a new module on there that is going to deal with AI. That's a very cheap course as well, by the way. Uh, there's another chapter in the latest Clark's book. So we're going to try to publish a number of smaller articles, which, which will be like building blocks to explain AI, and we're hope, hopefully, hopefully going to get those off the ground um, very, very shortly. Member events around AI have not always been successful. But we need to keep working at that. And... I'm going to leave you with one last slide now, my sinister slide. <laughs> whoever leads in AI, I should, I should say this in a very deep, whoever leads in AI will rule the world. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so, as you just alluded to, radiologist giving the last talk in a radiographer CPD conference. Thank you, Foddy, for making me the pantomime villain. Um, so, obviously, I had to reflect on this and start with the title. Uh, it seemed fairly innocuous there, but I just realized I'd probably be able to offend half of you at any one time with that title, given that you've now got multiple camps. I refer to the diagnostic radiographers, what about the reporting radiographers? So I thought about this. This is in the greatest traditions of Twitter, Schrodinger's title. It offends all of you, none of you at the same time. And I do mean radiology in the broadest sense of the word, since of course we are all big one, uh, big happy family now. Um, so the robots are coming, or are they? Um, that's my contact details if you want to throw a fence at me. Um, so what role will AI play in radiology in the broadest sense of the word, as I said? Well, let's start at the very beginning. We've had three excellent talks already. Um, thank you for stealing my thunder, all of you. Um, I'm going to exert um, radiologist um, prerogative and radiology explain this to you. What do we mean by AI? Well, artificial intelligence, that's all very well. Do we mean narrow intelligence, general intelligence, super intelligence? Some are going to pontificate about machine learning. We've heard about all these other things, deep learning, natural language processing, neural networks and so on and so on and so forth. Um, these are in the preserve of academia. Um, so I've coined this term applied intelligence. And remember, it's all about technology. It doesn't really matter. Any of these interactions, they're all AI. And frankly, let's not get hung up on these labels. Let's go back to that question then. Um, is this where we are? Or really, is this where we are? Um, possibly a bit of both. Um, how many of you know who this chap is? Yes, uh, we all know the eponymous uh, carpal bone thing, but actually he is par excellence an example of a CAD 
those of you who are of a certain age with as many white hairs as me will realize that we've been using these terms for at least a decade in terms of um, computer aid diagnostics and nodules. And during that time, we've had all these doom merchants and naysayers telling us that radiologists and pathologists are going to be replaced by AI. The last such prediction was made about four or five years ago. Unless someone's told me to the contrary, I am still getting paid. It hasn't quite been replaced. So clearly, this is all nonsense. But you know what? It makes headlines. It makes people feel important. Let's let them at it. So what about the role in radiography, then? Well, this is what photography used to look like. In the 80s, this is what photography became. This is a vision of radiography, clearly, in the 80s. And before you start throwing things at me, bear one thing in mind, and if you do take something away, just to build upon what's been said, unfortunately, the people who are working on these kind of systems, that pretty much is their extent of knowledge of both what you do and what I do and what we now collectively do. So it is really, really important that we get engaged in what's being developed so that it actually makes sense. Okay, uh, this slide has probably already changed. Um, there were about 200 companies worldwide this morning. There's probably about 267 by the time I got off uh, the underground from Houston. But crucially, there are currently less than 58 FDA-approved algorithms. Okay, everyone pontificates, everyone wants to be in this space because as we've said, this is the new Klondike. Okay, so what are the goals? Broadly, they are to improve quality provide more efficient care and more effective care. And by quality, clearly we mean the quality of image acquisition and if image interpretation diagnostics. We want the right test at the right time, at the most convenient time and place for the patient. And we want to ensure that we have reliable results distribution and that we can have reliable onward scheduling and suggestions. Uh, you may well have seen this uh, diagram. I do want to thank um, Hugh, who I've called it from previously, so this maps the, pretty much the workflow involved in patient imaging diagnostics. The vast majority of those algorithms I talked about deal in just this one space here. Okay? So what you've got is a number of AI companies who are basically aggregating a bunch of very narrow focused tools. Predominantly, they're dealing with brain bleeds, identifying lung nodules on CT, identifying pathology on chest x-rays, such as pneumothoraces and pneumonia. Big deal. You can do that. I can do that. How exactly are they going to help us? Okay. The worst bit is there's very little integration with the reporting workflow. I have to think twice about that word, the reporting workflow. Um, <clears throat> what's the point of drawing nice colored circles or squares or triangles around nodules on the CT? I've been trained to do that already, and then leaving it to me to validate whether or not it actually is a nodule or not. How does that help me to measure them? I've still got to draw lines through them. I still have to interact with them. Even few of them can actually do anything meaningful and engage directly with the report. So even if they were to do all these things and give me measurements, Muggins there has still got to talk about um, what slice number they are, what size they are, how they've changed. Okay, so what actually are the benefits beyond hype? Are there any? There are, but we do need to come back to when and how. Okay, just a quick tour de force, which is what the most of this talk is going to be there. A rapid run through this pathway to discuss how we might find uses for AI in our workplace. Um, as has already been discussed by Dr. Redlard, there are some which work in this space. Um, the examples par excellence are these TB screening tools which are deployed around the world that did great work and help mankind uh, achieve um, diagnoses and treatment. Some others uh, which are coming out of the academic space are uh, working at the acquisition phase to do dose reduction. And what we're doing predominantly is to improve the diagnostic capabilities in low dose CT. We all do IRMA and all that kind of stuff, and anything we can do to reduce dose whilst maintaining image quality is clearly going to be good. Um, there are some which are coming out now which deal in this space, which is the quantification. The, the main examples I've seen here are lung volumes, uh, what the extent, the percentage of emphysema is, and all that kind of stuff for quantification. Useful for playing surgery, of course. Okay, so broadly, and we're looking ahead, um, there are four stages of the patient imaging pathway that algorithmic interactions, and another acronym for AI if you wish, pre-imaging, image acquisition, interpretation, reporting, and post-reporting, and I would suggest that there are going to be some uses in all four. So what about the pre-imaging stage? Well, tools to guide the clinicians for best use of the presentations. It means you or I will have to argue with them less about the nonsensical referrals that come our way, clearly. 
Um, in terms of optimized scheduling, many places now have multi-site or multiple scanners. We don't have to play the game juggling lists. It can route the most effectively, most convenient and efficient use of resources, and also clearly to make it more useful for the patient. What about giving the appropriate information to the patient so that they better understand what tests they're getting and the need for them? This will go toward digital informed consent. The more informed and engaged the patient is, the less um, they will be inclined to no-show, again, improving efficiency and effectiveness. Um, we've alluded to NHS Digital. Um, this is actually, you may have read um, in August last year, something that the NHS has done with Amazon. And that image on the top right is actually called from the NHS digital website. So here is the vision. Uh, you're coughing. You, we have a lecture in the house. How do you treat the flu? And given that Amazon is also acquiring pharmacies, it isn't beyond the realms of possibility that they're going to wheedle in some way of getting antibiotics to treat all these viral infections that we've got. Great. A little bit boring, I've got to say. So how about this instead, then? We know we've got this spy in our house. Listen to everything we say or do. Um, you're coughing away. Hey, okay, you've been coughing. So, <laughs> okay, so you have truly digital care. And for those of you aghast at the implications from Irma and all that kind of stuff, remember some of the guidelines coming out are that people who cough need to get a diagnosis within three weeks. So actually what you or I think about the useful enough test is irrelevant. They're all going to get CTs anyway. So let's just digitize, digitize it and automate it and really embrace automation and AI. I think that sounds a bit more exciting to me than, hey, Alexa, what do you do with the flu? Although, clearly, it's earned its money over the past few weeks. Okay, so, at the acquisition stage, scan time and quality and dose management. Okay, multi-parametric protocols to reduce scan time. And the examples uh, we've talked about here, for example, are for MR prostates, um, reducing motion blur. What do we do for chest CTs? We ask patients who can barely breathe to hold their breath and then complain that the images are blurry. And so anything that we can do about that will be better. And how about this automated image review and reject analysis? No need to faff back and forth between screens. You take the image, it assesses whether or not it actually meets diagnostic criteria. If it doesn't, you, at the point of the examination, you can know whether or not it's useful or not. In terms of dose management, we can look about some noise reduction studies. And it, these are, they're trying to find themselves a niche in lung cancer screening services here. Okay. So we're moving on here to on-scanner image detection. And there's a whole host of things it can do. Um, critical findings, including P and pneumothorax, brain bleeds, possible malignancy. Um, there's a role for normal detection, either automated reporting in the brave new world, or if not, well, as an absolute minimum, we can absolutely find a role for radiog for less discharge to improve efficiencies during that pathway. Patients are imaging before, and we've talked about this prioritization. Well, what about it actually assessing on the scanner? What interval change analysis there has been comparing to a previous scan? Has it changed or not? If it has, has it got better or worse? If it's got worse, well, you probably need to report that a bit more urgently than those which either haven't changed or have improved. Again, gives some tools to deploy a limited resource, which, ladies and gentlemen, are you or I to be most effective in what we do, which is deal with Report Mountain. Okay, so... We've talked about the role in lung cancer screening services. Let's just circle back to this. We talked about this um, before. So yes, there is a role, but it just still depends on how we think about it. Identifying lung nodules, I was rather dismissive. Identifying pneumothoraces and pneumonia and pneumothoraces. We, we all do this in our sleep. But lung cancer screening, there's going to be a shed load of CTs that are banged out their front and center. There's no way we're going to be able to keep up with them. So what if we deploy software solutions as the first pass to identify any which actually have lesions so we can target those and report them accordingly? We can screen out the normals. We can put, potentially have one-stop clinics because we're targeting our reporting resources to those which may or may not have pathology to them. And if we follow the same model as what's going on in the breast um, world, potentially these algorithms can develop and we can use them as second reading tools in our lung cancer screening world. In terms of on-scanning image detection, patients come through, said she was at imaging, goes back to a &E. In the interval, they're waiting for porters to do all this. They're waiting for somebody, either the or me, to report them or for the junior doctor to actually get around to have a looking at the image that they requested four hours ago. In all that time, either the patient sat there perfectly well, wasting time, getting a hospital-acquired uh, pneumonia, or 
They've been sat for four and a half, five hours doing absolutely nothing. Patients that have them come down from ICU. These are incredibly sick patients who've had lines put in that they want to do definitive management for multiple hours wasted whilst there's going to be some interaction of whether or not the line's in the right place or not. So what would be wrong with the algorithms at the time of detection giving some feedback to liberate time? So what we're looking at here is AI within the radiology space, not for the benefit of you or I, but for clinicians and in turn for patients to make more efficient and effective care. We've talked about this already in some of the other talks, so I'll gloss over a little bit. Uh, Workless management to get the right case of the right reporter based on either specialism, based on an urgency of findings, or based on any KPIs that you've got in your local institutions. If you're going to get fined because you've agreed to report the left toe within one and a half hours and it gets to one hour and 20 minutes, and what's the point of getting the business manager breathing down your neck or the lead radiographer? You can just be bubbled, you know, bubble to the top of your list, crack on with it, and we can go, just prioritize the work we do a bit more carefully. I've discussed this in passing already. Uh, we can put together some normal pathways and batch our cases accordingly into those pathways. Let's actually get onto the reporting bit in the next phase of it now. Optimized presentation of imaging. Hanging protocols, God almighty, the bane of my life. Sitting down before you do anything, you have to spend five minutes at a time getting this thing in a way that you actually would like to present it. Well, what if it actually did that for you? Um, I've said more than once to PAX companies, I go to eBay, I go to Amazon, after a few uses, it can actually remember how I quite like my screen to look. This multi-million pound software with my tens of thousands of pounds um, workstations, can't seem to do it. Well, let's let the computer do it for me then. Um, pain, query cause, great. Um, so why not let it bring us some more details from the EPR or from any of the other multiple resources available to it? Not just text information. What about if you've got a potential colorectal cancer patient, how they've had endoscopy? You know they're not going to tell you they've had an endoscopy already. You know they're not going to tell you that this patient's actually got a 14 centimeter, or um, got a tumor at 14 uh, centimeters on the um, flexible sigma endoscopy. So let it present it to you. So when you're reporting the CT colonography, you have as much information as you possibly can to leverage best use of the resources. We've discussed lesion segmentation and all the many ills that go towards it. But there are in plenty of research which has shown that humans are incredibly poor at differentiating between true positive and false positive. If an algorithm is going to draw a circle around 17 lesions, the chances are you are going to say at least 16 of them are going to be a nodule. Whereas if you'd have looked at that blind, you would probably wouldn't have blinked twice at a number of them. So instead of buying into the hype, what if instead we use it as an on-demand analysis aid? You're reviewing an image, you're not sure about a certain area, click the button, you see what the algorithm thinks of it as well, to reinforce your own views. And by doing this, it's a second opinion, and it reduces this risk of false positives. The other bit is we want it to be part of a natural reporting workflow. What you don't want in the context of a CT is to load up the CT the thorax, click a button, load up the chest um, AI, um, draw lines through the nodule, let it measure, half measure them, um, tell you what they are or not. Okay, great, you scroll a bit further down, you got to the abdomen, you unclick the chest tools and load up the abdomen tools and so on and so on and so forth. What if instead it actually segmented across your whole thorax, abdomen, pelvis, CT? It identified all the pathology. If you've had imaging before, it's automatically measured them to you. It's automatically compared with the ones that were there before. And even better, well, hey, it's put them in a nice table which can be inserted into your report with the resist criteria. That means you can concentrate on important bits rather than the mind-numbingly boring things which are counting nodules. And the number of times I've been told, ah, chest radiologists, you lot are going to be out of a job because these nodules are already been counted. God, bring it on. I could <laughs> get on with just something less boring instead. Okay, a bit more in the reporting here because it's the new big thing. Um, some rather prosaic things. Image analysis um, support diagnostic suggestions. Is it fracture? Is it not fracture? Is there pneumothorax? Is there not? And we've discussed the benefits of this from the, for the clinicians already. Frankly, you and I could sometimes do with a little bit of a phone a friend as well, can't we? Press the button. What do you think? Um, Dr. Radler has nicely already discussed the concept of radionomic features, classified tumors, and texture analysis. And we can also take that further. The number of times we internally have defined certain things, enhancement characteristics, whether or not there's fat or not within a certain nodule, 
Well, then let the algorithms look at these kind of banalities on images and suggest the most likely characteristics of what you're looking at to stop having to do multiple additional tests. You can also use it as clinical decision support, not for the referrer, but for us at the reporting side as well. It would give us access to all the latest pathways to ensure that the advice we give conforms to current international standards. An example would be nodule follow-up guidelines. Those of you who report um, chest nodules day in, day out will know that there are BTS or flash inside the guidelines, which give really clear indications of when you should be doing these follow-on studies. The number of times those who perhaps aren't as familiar with them will basically pick a number out of the ether and you'll have uh, CTs at three months, four months, seven months, uh, depending on which way the wind's blowing. Well, we can actually make the care we do more standardized and conform to best practice if we have these presented to us. At this stage, we're now still at the tail end of the reporting. Natural language processing, and I don't mean improve the accuracy of VR, but God almighty, it could probably do with it. Um, I don't even mean suggesting next word and next phrases, which our very, very expensive VR packages can't yet provide to us, and yet our mobile phones have been doing quite readily for the past five or 10 years or so. Thank you very much. What I'm talking about is this concept of semantic reporting, where we want to have um, this happy medium between rather boring, clearly see what I think about it, templates-based reporting and the art and science of reporting. Um, and also, we want to create data. We want it machine data mineable. We all want it standardized. But we also don't want huge, big lists. Um, so a really simple example. When you're in any one workplace, the clinicians who've known you for the past 10, 15, 20 years that you've been working there will know that when you say normal, that means a whole host of things. So, why don't we bring that thing into our reporting pathways? So when your report says normal, the clinician getting your report knows that what that actually means is there's no size significant media standard. I've not, the central airways are clear, the lungs are clear, the pleural surfaces are clear, there is no um, sinister lesion to the bony thorax. All those pieces of information are in a subtext layer, so those who don't perhaps know you, who want to ensure that when you say normal, or when you say normal apart from that nodule in the right upper quadrant, You've looked at all these other things because they are available in the report. You can just put them in a subtext layer. Um, well, if we're letting these algorithms look at all these images and um, suggest stuff to us, why not? Automatic generation of some trees. You've, got, you've spent the past 10, 15 minutes pontificating wildly about all these characteristics. Well, there are um, solutions out there which can aggregate these. And for example, create the TNM staging from your descriptors you've done automatically provide a very succinct summary so you don't have to do that. You don't miss anything in the rambling three pages you've already done. Taking that one stage further and again, why not automatic report creation? It's not a challenge for us. What's better, an algorithm produced report or the dreaded uh, there will be no diagnostic report for this image, which is still par excellence, more than three quarters of the orthopedic or chest x-ray uh, imaging that's done in ICU. And you know, we, on, on the one hand, we say that these are really, really difficult pieces of imaging to do, and then we leave them to usually the most junior member of a hospital to not write anything in the notes about. Um, we've discussed already their role as second readers in breast radiology. Um, we've discussed already potential roles as a screening tool. And you know what? If the algorithm thinks they're normal, why can we not allow it to provide a normal examination? Then we define rules within our institutions of how we're going to handle those. Better than a no report, isn't it? And even factor reporting. You know what, it isn't rocket science, it's fractures there or not there. The algorithms can usually define these quite nicely because they've had to. It's probably pretty good at giving fairly simple reports from them as well. Another aspect we can use about this natural language processing is in the concepts of peer review and quality assurance. A really simple example, we want to build up mental libraries as we report. That usually requires someone to review our um, imaging during our training phase and normally they're busy people as well, trying to do some reporting, that is a roadblock in itself. <laughs> what if you had an algorithm which could look at the image, look at your report, suggest whether or not there was concordance between what you said and what it thinks the image has said? What you're doing here is basically giving a, a, a training aid to reporting radiographers and um, specialist um, registrars at that phase, basically to build up the image library once you validate and trust the algorithm well enough, then you can potentially unleash it to allow them to crack on quicker and with more confidence for those cases where there's concordance between them and the algorithm and phone a friend, phone a teacher in those cases where there's discordance, for example. 
in the post-reporting phase, we've touched on this already, but how much of your life is wasted trying to find clinicians to impart information to them? Um, they all, all want automated reporting, but they don't want it because you know what, they're too busy to actually read the emails that systems are gonna send them. They really want butlers, really, to give the results to them, time of one. But we can automate these things, and that isn't your fault or mine, but we can get the critical findings. We can automate discharge pathways in A&Es and normals, as we've discussed already, or at least give the tools to facilitate um, radiographer cyst pathways. Scheduling. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about this very much because I'll get quite annoyed about it, but the number of cases that are added to MDTs which are entirely inappropriate, not been reported, not cancer, you've got 20 odd cases to discuss in one hour, and you can guarantee that the most complicated one that you really need 20 minutes to discuss is the 19th on the list and you've got five minutes to go and two cases. So if we have found some way of adding cases automatically from MDT, of screening out the appropriateness of cases to go onto them, that'll be quite useful. We've discussed already the scheduling scheduled for onward referral, but what about the cases where you've recommended an onward investigation? We are the people best placed to decide what the most appropriate next test would be in these pathways. And yet what do we do? We stick it in text and get the clinicians to have to refer, understandably to get annoyed, and more appropriately, um, it's a huge waste of time. You've reported it, it gets validated, they pick you up at some point in the future, then it takes them a while to schedule it, then we take four weeks to get on it. Well, if you've said in your uh, report that you recommend a chest x-ray in four to six weeks, if we've said that you, the next appropriate test is going to be a PET CT, well then let the system get on with it and arrange it once we arrange the pathways for it. Again, we can normalize, we can standardize the care we provide in terms of best practice. Okay, so I was told to provide three learning points. These would be my three. So it does have the potential to provide greater efficiency and I hope what I've tried to do is take you uh, through a tawdry force of that entire pathway to demonstrate not necessarily what's out there but potentially what could be out there but for us to be engaged in the process and challenge the companies who are producing some of these things to make them more reasonable, more meaningful. The challenge equally to us is to not be so self-centered or self-centric in terms of what the usefulness of the algorithm might be, but to look at in the greater context of what might be the most efficient um, application for the care of the patient and for the use of the clinicians doing it. That last one is again, has been said by all three speakers, I'll reiterate this again, radiology in the wider sense, the word stakeholders, we really do need to be engaged more appropriately um, in this space. And then if nothing else, it doesn't give the AI companies the excuse to say, well, we would have done it if you'd have given us some indication of what you wanted. Thank you.
Oh, that's not going to sit. So, welcome back, everyone. We've got the great and the good of AI and radiography on a panel discussion now. Um, for all of those listening to the live stream, please tweet using the hashtag. We've got a couple of people looking and including me. I'm not ignoring you. I'm trying to pick everything up from Twitter on my phone about what questions you have for the panel. We have roving mics, which Sarah is bravely... Thick. Does anyone want to start us off with a question for the panel? If not, you have all of my questions. Oh, two. Excellent. Um, what typically t um, system requirements would, would be needed for this extra um, algorithms? Because what I find is in, in quite a lot of private clinics, you get the cheapest and nastiest computers to work with. And I, I would think that these will need a little bit extra resourcing powers to actually work. I'm sure the state of the uh, I NHS IT infrastructure is robust and is definitely the best money can buy. How many Windows XP computers are there? Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, Alvin. You said you work in the private sector? And uh, one thing I agree is I agree with you that NHS has better resources than the private sector when it comes to IT because the private sectors, they look at the profit margin clearly. The NHS, at least, we can uh, say that, look, if you don't provide this, we can't report. So then, uh, the, actually, NHS is a better place, personally, I feel, to get a better IT support and IT infrastructure than a private hospital where we have to really uh, find a way of getting it. What I would say, though, is, uh, and you, we've seen this played out over the last two, three months, is this isn't a one or the other um, argument. Absolutely, we need better IT infrastructure, but absolutely, that shouldn't be at the cost of this kind of development as well, and, and vice versa. Um, the NHS and the private, the health IT sector needs to be appropriately resourced, given the tools, we need the platform there, but at the same time, we need the development to go on that we can leverage when we're using it. Well, yes, I just looked at, I mean, I mentioned in my, one of my slides, the clinical cockpit, which is uh, uh, a dream, I know, <coughs> but uh, it's very important for all the systems to, to talk to each other. Otherwise, we'll go nowhere. I mean, yes, at the moment, as it stands, they're all sitting, sitting separately in isolation. But if there is a way of uh, getting everything together and we can access one workstation from which we can access everything, that will be the dream future. Uh, otherwise, we'll be stuck. I think we totally agree that you might have a, you know, the infrastructure might suffer, but I think it's going to even be the other way around. You might have a Ferrari computer and not having sorted out the methodologies properly, the validation of the algorithms. So I think you need to have both things at the same time, improved infrastructure and improved methodology to use AI. Probably it's, it's also important we think about it in the first place. Um, and in that regard, when you're purchasing new systems, don't be swayed by the cheapest solution. It's going to need a little bit of thinking. We do need the solutions which are interoperable, which can help break out of these silos. Um, and we all have a responsibility there. Too often we've taken a back seat when these things are done unto us and then complain after the event, which we're fantastic at, obviously, that things don't work or they don't work well enough. But not only should we be engaging with the AI companies, equally we need to be engaging with our own IT uh, departments with our business managers, with the procurement departments, to give them some steer on what direction we want to go with, and, what, and that challenge will be then for the companies to deliver to it. I'm desperately trying to think. Uh, there, there, there's, there's some report I read, I cannot <coughs> remember the title of it, but, but one of the statements in that um, review was that it would be a major obstacle. And, and adoption of AI in the NHS would, would, would trail many other countries. But if I could remember which one it was, I'd tell you. Out there somewhere. We aimed at Christina. Um, it's to do with staff training. Um, I work for in health operations, and you said getting radiographers 
in this country is difficult. Um, staffing is difficult. So do you think with the introduction of AI, it's going to make it easier for radiographers who specialize in certain things like MR or CT or cardiac, that it's going to make it easier for them to cross over into different modalities? Um, because you said about everyone potentially becoming data scientists. So do you think that will make it easier for them to specialize in the different things and make it easier to staff that way? Well, I think AI is a tool, and it depends on how you use it to, um, to use all the applications and apply it in practice. I think definitely there, will be, there should be some transferable skills within AI with, which will allow people to transition from one modality to the other, uh, hopefully easier than it is now. Uh, but certainly you will need to have the know-how of each modality that you are based. So the answer is potentially yes. Yeah, I think was it, was it Donald Rumsfeld who talked about the n n unknown unknowns? Mm -hmm. I think you've just um, you've just identified one. I, any, anything is possible. You know, we just don't know. That that's the in a way that's the beauty of it. We can make it what whatever we want it to be, with the right, with the adoption of the right <laughs> systems. I just a word. I mean, I agree that specialization can be good and bad as well. We all have to specialize in one, one area. I agree with you. At the same time, we should not be de-skilled in other areas. So I think we should be able to do at least the basics in most things, but be good at one. Um, from a radiographer's perspective, like fun five workhorse kind of level, who um, the vast majority of can't attend these sort of conferences, don't really know that the conversation about AI is really happening, even though we know that we use it every day, um, virtual grids and software and things like that. And like I know that it is more prevalent than we might be aware of. I think we need to um, make sure that the communication to the large uh, workforce is um, as good as it can be, especially in terms of like, the questions coming up at the minute in the general public about data being a commodity um, and who who's protecting that, especially with medical imaging. So with all of these startups and things like that, helping um, like with all of the solutions that we're thinking of tonight and that you've discussed, um, who who is, like obviously you say the sec Secretary of State, but what role and what organization, is it the RCR, is it the Society of Radiographers, <coughs> is protecting the medical imaging data in that? Have we got a role on the governmental boards, what is the situation at the minute, um, and also, <coughs> how do we involve radiographers who work on the front line in a &E or whatever, how do we involve them in a practical way with the startup companies that are looking for those solutions? It's, I, don't, I don't think I'm expecting an answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a question. <laughs> is, it, is, is that for me? <laughs> It is now. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and I think that there is a concern. I think there is a real concern about how, how patient data is, is, could, be, could be abused. We, we have measures in place to make sure it, it, it doesn't get, you know, become abused. But at the same time, we want to encourage companies to, to, to get that data to to be able to develop the things that we need. And it's, blimey, what we need is a, what we need is a data protection expert in the audience. Um. <laughs> Mr. Roving microphone to the second row, please. Uh, what, a, what a great way to get out of answering that question. Eh? Um, I think it's, what's quite interesting well, is NHS that's... Digital, where they had the, um, it was a few years ago, and I can't remember the program name, we actually cancelled it because so many people, there was uh, not enough security and control around patients' choice and patients' rights. So there's now a digital opt-out where you can register as a patient that you do not want your data shared. How are we able to make sure that, that you've gone to NHS Digital, you've completed the digital opt-out form as a patient, how are we aware that, that my data, your data, that person's data, is then not actually used? within this? Do we have a flag within imaging saying, I opted out from NHS Digital? I think it was the 1st of April is going to come in. So how are we now going to have these algorithms in place where patients who have digitally opted out, 
how do we assure that? Malcolm? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah. Um, but you asked the question, who protects it? So I am a radiographer by profession. Been, next month I'll be qualified 40 years. Um, <coughs> I'm the data protection officer for InHealth. My, nobody will bear me out in this, my mantra for the past four or five years, even a bit longer, is why am I the only radiographer in the country who's a data protection officer? Why am I the only person who's gone, got the qualification? Because you know what I don't get? Is that we live our whole profession, our whole career by laws. We have IRMA, we have health and safety. All that has come in during my career. And GDPR and data protection 2018 is just another law. And we need to be teach, uh, teaching people how to do that. And please, please, could we get this onto your agenda Thank and onto you. your curriculum because it is so important. You know, I've got plenty of colleagues around the room who will tell you that if they've got a question on data protection, they will come to me first. And they'll come to me for my advice and my guidance on it. I don't know all the answers, but in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And when you're dealing with some of these AI companies, sorry, <laughs> I've used it again, sorry. Um, but when you're dealing with some of these AI companies, it's been interesting that I have known more than people that they're putting up to be the experts. And the difference is because I can put data protection and clinical together. Move on. Um, you mentioned a couple of things there. One was the, the thing about the prevalence of AI, and then we moved on to this concept of the patient data protection. Um, I'm going to cringe when I say something now because I heard it and I cringed and I swore I'd never use it, but it's probably the best analogy I've heard. Um, AI is like teenage sex. Everyone's talking about it. Very few people are doing it. And actually, that is still true. Um, there are conferences left, right, and center. There are articles published left, right, and center. There really aren't that many applications that are used relative to the amount of verbiage that's generated about it. So that's partly why you haven't seen it in places, because there isn't where. I think this is probably a watershed year where we're probably moving away from a lot of the hype and rubbish that people have pontificated about to useful uses of AI in clinical practice, and we'll probably develop it in a meaningful way. And when we talk about different countries, I think this is where the UK really can be a world leader. We do have very stringent governance laws um, and perhaps we've, in some ways, overthought this whole concept of the um, patient data usage and all that kind of stuff. But at least what it means is we're not setting precedents. And when we implement it, we're going to implement these things in a safe, meaningful, reproducible way. Um, far be it for me to be controversial. Clearly, that's not me, as you well know. But um, <laughs> if we go into this whole issue of the who owns the data and all that kind of stuff, I, you know, I, I, again, I, I get a little bit irritated by that uh, discussion. Um, when you take an image of a patient, does the patient own that image? It doesn't really, you know, they don't. We, we take it for the benefit of patient care, and that image can move from hospital to hospital to facilitate patient care. Where it gets tricky is when all of a sudden we've given this idea of it having a monetary value, and now suddenly in this world where everyone wants their piece of the pie, patients are suddenly thinking their data holds value to them, and they want their 3P per chest x-ray. We really need to get away from that notion. And if you subscribe to the fact that if you're having imaging to facilitate care, the same way we've been doing research for the past donkey's you know, years going on, well then, as long as it's appropriately anonymized, uh, what we don't want is this concept where, uh, you know, as has been alluded to before, private companies shouldn't be benefiting from NHS patient data. The NHS should benefit from NHS patient data. And that's where I think the arguments need to be drawn up that we, if there is value to it, the value should be for the greater good of the population in this country and for the healthcare system, not down to the pound, shilling, and pence for an individual patient. And at that, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> um, but sorry, I just want to answer something. Uh, our colleague asked, uh, asked about how can we involve uh, radiography with the industry as well, yes? Because to them, at the moment, we seem to be invisible. Well, I think, as, as I said, and all of my you know, co-speakers discussed, is radiography is actually doing things currently in the background. One of the reasons, I think, why 
we are not out there yet, is because the variability of our practice is huge compared to radiology, because radiology is mostly, excuse me, that's discussion, is, is reporting where we're doing so many different other things in, in the clinical practice of radiography. So we try really to make sense of all these different areas. So while we work on the background to get the concepts right, people are actually uh, doing conferences. So in, at City University, we organize a by-invitation-only conference in April, which is exactly about AI, where we bring together our students, our really valuable students on undergraduates, postgraduate, and research courses at City. We bring the clinical partners from our major um, university hospital collaborators, we bring research collaborators, we bring the industry as well. So we want to work together and brainstorm and say, what are the needs from the clinical partners? How can we help in terms of research capacity? What do the students really want to know and learn for the future? What the patients need and what the industry can offer? So we actually will all together in this area. So I think what is really important is the getting together because they don't know of us. And it's, I found it very surprising. Many of the industry partners don't really know the difference between a radiographer and a radiologist. So I think it's important to put this name and title and role up there uh, and explain exactly what we're doing if they don't know. Because I think if they realize what we're doing, how big of a workforce we are, they will be there next to us, working with us to try and make things better. I'm going to take a question from Twitter. So Fiona Miller has um, come in uh, on using the uh, robots are coming. So AI and undergraduate education, where's the boundary between collaboration and competition? We all want that unique selling point for attracting students, but with evidence so thin on the ground, you need to be sharing more. Your thoughts? We need to be sharing more. Yeah, so if you, every university is competing for students, it's fee paying, bursaries are dead, long live nine grand a year. How do we do it? I personally think that the more the competition for universities in this topic, the better for the profession, because I think we are not competing enough. We have to compete much more on that topic. So I would like to see, I would like to see more PhDs in this area in the next five years for radiography. I would like to see more modules. I wouldn't like to say we are the only one with the first one who are doing it. I would like to see much more movement in this area. So actually, competition is going to be quite healthy and very useful to carry the profession forward. I don't see it as a threat, I see it as a need. Next question. With um, society becoming more Google orientated and we get more patients that are Googling their symptoms before they come into x-ray departments, etc. Do you think with the AI and technology advancement in society that will get more combativeness against the profession in terms of patients saying, well, actually, you think it's cancer, but I think I've got a PE, or I think I'm end stage four, or actually, I need to get a second opinion because Google is telling me you're wrong. And then more negligence cases that are put against us because their app is telling them that actually the diagnosis that the, <laughs> the radi radiologist has given or the radiographer that has given is wrong. Have you seen those studies where they've put the Apple Watch on bananas and it diagnoses AF? <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> and uh, I think our clinical colleagues will tell you that actually those arguments have already been happening. It, yeah. They're now filtering through, I think, tools in radiology and radiography because we're becoming more involved in direct patient care, whereas previously we were hiding nicely behind our screens and, um, you know, be they lead screens or computer screens. Um, so I don't think it's a future thing. I think we're already there at that stage. I'm Håkon Jemli from uh, the Norwegian Society of Radiographers, and I have a question and uh, targeted to probably both uh, Kevin and, and Christina regarding um, the curriculums, the future curriculums for radiographers. Uh, obviously, there are some things we should put in there related to AI and to data protection and uh, things that has to do with this, but should we... What should we take out? What should these uh, new things uh, replace? Or do we have to expand the whole education of radiographers? This is a big challenge, and I would really like to have some uh, <laughs> answers to this. <laughs> yeah, I, if, if you look at the, uh, I think I'm right in saying the radiology uh, curriculum is, is changing. 
It's going more from rather than retention. It's, you know, it's not a case of you have to learn all this and, and retain that forever. It's more about this is how you acquire data. This is how, how you acquire knowledge. And this is how you use knowledge. So and I'm not an academic, but it would seem to me logical that, that we, we have to consider a different approach to what we are teaching. But you, I, to me, you cannot exclude these new developments. You, you, just, you just can't. They have, to, they, have to, they have to have a priority. What, you, know, you have to prioritize what goes into the curriculum. It's all about patient care. It's a, you know, how, how, the, how technology is developing. They have to be in there. You then have to look afresh at, at what we're currently teaching and say, well, you don't need to know like this in detail, but this is how you, this is where you, this is how you acquire that information. This is, this is the purpose you need to know that. But it's so easy for me to say, because I don't have to deliver the curriculum. <laughs> but Christina does. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would be satisfied by your answer, so I wouldn't have to answer that. I think it's a very, very nice question, and it's something quite philosophical as well for us working in academia, that we have to constantly think. We can see the strengths here. I totally agree with you that we have a knowledge base, and we have certain things we need to know as part of the profession. At the same time, technology evolves rapidly, and we have to catch up with that. On the other, front, on the other side, it's all about patient-centered care. So which area are we going to be focusing on? I think there will be a transitional time where we have to continue doing what we're doing and learning something new. So in this case, it might be AI technologies. And then there will be a, a time in five or 10 years period from now that we will be totally reimagining the curriculum, you know, top to bottom, from bottom to top. At the moment, what we're doing at City University, I can speak about the university I represent, we are doing things in a modular way. So we introduce the concept of AI, the basic principles at master's level. And we are also considering things uh, for, the, uh, for research projects in undergraduate and postgraduate levels. So we're actually doing things like that. At the same time that research evolves, we will be learning more about what AI means for the profession, and we can adjust accordingly. So it's, I think it's like a hand-to-hand -hand thing. It's much more iterative, the, the things we will be doing in the future. It's not like now, okay, great, today we change everything for AI, because we are learning what AI means for us. And in fact, I'm just looking at the Royal College curriculum, which is just released, actually, and being implemented in August 2020, this year, for the new trainees, and there's one section on emerging technologies, and the first thing there is AI and machine learning. So that should be part of the curriculum for us, for radiologists, I mean, uh, training. So the same should, should, should apply to you as well. Yes. I think we're working, I mean, for this module, I'm saying, we are working quite a lot with the computer scientists because we cannot do AI without them. For them, AI has been around for 50 years. For mm. us, it's only the last few years. So for them, it's like they're, you know, bread and butter. So we're working with them. What they, ca they don't know is they don't know our context. So we are there to uh, help them, explain that to them, and do workshops with them for our students. So it's, it's an evolving, iterative situation where the more we learn about what it means for us, the more we will adjust that. And it might mean that we have different roles within AI, not just a data scientist one, but someone who's actually patient centric care based exactly about attending to the needs using AI. I, I also think there is a role for, for the professional bodies in this as well. Because you're right, you can't, you can't expect people to, 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 to qualify and know everything. And I think there is definitely a role for us in the professional bodies to actually um, build, you know, with, with CPT modules and webinars, stuff like that. We need to be more creative to, to, to bridge that knowledge gap because we really do need it. So we make position statements. <laughs> <laughs> I heard there's a great one coming out as well, Hakan. <laughs> so I, I've got a question. Um, who saw the mainstream media coverage in the first week of January about breast screening and AI? Show of hands. About Most. half. Of those people, who clicked through to read the paper? One. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask the one person if they read past the abstract. 
Um, if you didn't, okay, fine. So there was a, a, a company, a relatively well-funded, well-known company, um, apparently that computers are better than humans at reading mammography. And when you actually looked at the paper, what was found was that it was an American, it was a massive study, hundreds of thousands of cases, <coughs> American versus US, uh, sorry, American versus UK screening. And when you actually read even the abstract of the paper, what it found was, was that screening mammography in the UK with double readers is very good. And the computer wasn't actually better than it. It was just no worse. So what was the computer better than? The computer was better than a single read American radiologist who had no fellowship training and had no minimum reads per year. And then you actually look into the method section and all of that data was a study of six radiologists reading mammograms. But you've got this hype, you've got this very, very effective PR machine that has pumped out this story, has put it in the mainstream media, it's covered everywhere. But as radiographers, and with an honourable mention from a few radiologists, we're not engaging in this research, and not even engaging in, it, in conducting the research, <coughs> but are we evidence practitioners enough to say that's fine, or is this just a, I'm being moderately sceptical, a ploy to get people ready, so they'll say, well, why aren't the computers reading my mammogram? They're as accurate as I am, and we can't expect the general public to have a research awareness and to be evidence-based if, as radiographers, we're not even consuming the evidence <coughs> that's given to us. Uh, funnily, funnily enough, we just started, signed off, uh, at, um, not a deal, but a uh, uh, MOU with the, our PAX vendor to do the same study locally in UK, where we have, where we all have two, radi two radiologists uh, or reporting mammographers doing uh, mammography. So we want to validate, we are going through the phases, uh, uh, phase one and phase two very pretty quickly because that's, uh, the data is already out there. But phase three is the one which is more clinical, which we want to do it this year. So you're right, it has to cater to the UK. Uh, UK is different from US completely, the way we report things and where we practice and the pathways, et cetera. So we, have to see, we want to see how it, we can implement in the UK population. And going back to your question earlier, we want, I mean, all of us should be involved in this. One way of involving, which I'm doing it now is, speak to your local, I mean, you have your PAX vendor, whoever it is, ACPA, K-Stream, Sectra, whoever it is. Then you have your machines, from Philips, Siemens, uh, uh, Canon, whoever it is again, G, don't, let's not forget G, four of them. So, and uh, engage with them. All of them have AI projects going on. So it's best to engage with the local PAX vendors or the machine vendors. And they must be having some projects going on and try to do it in your local hospital. And this is what we're doing locally, which I'm, I'm hoping to publish the results later this year. So I think I agree with you, Nick, in that uh, we can't just look at the headlines. We need to delve more deeply. And the UK market is different, and we need to tailor it, uh, tailor the research to our market, and whether it's beneficial for our population or not. So Nick knew exactly what he was doing by pulling the pin out of that grenade. Um, I forgive me, but I'm going to pick on you again because you raised that question earlier about this whole concept of engaging with companies and, and the other. I thought you were going to talk about the article about pigeons reporting. Uh, and diagnosing That's breast cancer. That's my follow-up. Thanks. Well, so, 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 so <clears throat> if you think back to a few years ago, and, and, and in reference to some comments I made earlier in my talk as well, there is a very, very famous big blue company that told us that radiology was dead because, you know, their very, very expensive piece of software had gone through 330 man-hours of radiologists and oncology research papers and blah, blah, blah. Um, where's that solution? It's not ubiquitous throughout the country. It's now small print. Um, the problem you have, really, is that you have these solutions which have raised millions in venture capital funding. Um, they need to demonstrate some output. And how do you demonstrate output? Is by saturating LinkedIn, Twitter, and um, unfortunately, journalistic articles with junk and hype. Um, and when you scratch beneath the surface, and so the obligation we have is to scratch beneath the surface. And as it says, to read beyond the abstract sometimes and challenge back. The, the, the problem I do have is that it really shouldn't be for us to have to go cap in hand to these companies and say, please, sir, can we play with you? Um, bear in mind, unfortunately, we're expensive resources, all of us, compared to medical students, compared to the lay public who they give scripts and use them to label data. Um, what we should be saying is that if you want meaningful products which actually are viable 
then you need to speak to the people who use them and who've been in this field for the past decades or so. Um, and then in the same way in terms of the applications, they want to be able to demonstrate sexy products which do great things, which may have little clinical value, but you know what? It's great and it captures the audience and it captures the reader when you talk about it. Talking about a, a, an algorithm which measures all your nodules for you and puts a, a nice report with resist criteria in your PAX uh, templates based reporting is dull. But you know what? It's bloody useful. And so what they need to do is they have to learn to be more sophisticated in their messaging, and that's for us to push back against them and see through this rubbish. I, on the other hand, believe everything I read in the newspapers. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and in 2016, I remember the red bus, and, with, uh, and, and, and that's, that, that's proved absolutely accurate. Yeah, cut the men's market. Thank you, <laughs> Justin. Also. Oh, yeah. I haven't got them. Sorry, Justin. I haven't got it. <coughs> Justin, do you want to go now? <clears throat> so, first one is with the implementation of AI, will some of the radiologists' roles shift to the radiographer? That's one question, I think. And then there's another one collaboration, is it more likely? And what will happen to reporting radiographers? It's fairly heavy for the last <laughs> two questions. <laughs> Who's going to take it on? <coughs> Any takers on the radiographers no, no, versus radiologists versus... You know, we, we've, we've talked about radiologists. You know, the, the focus has always been on radiologist reporters up until this point. It, we're talking about a tool. Mm. It's a tool. It's not a replacement. I mean, maybe in 50 years' time, it will be a replacement. But you know what? I'm not going to worry about that. <laughs> well, going back to, actually, Nick's... Um, article earlier and when he talked about the separate differentiation between the US and the UK in terms of breast reporting, there are a number of other studies which have demonstrated that in terms of some of these chest x-ray and other plain film reporting tools, um, AI plus um, a non-specialist reporter can be as good as a specialist reporter. So there's value in it. I think what we have to do is we have to learn to not rise to the bait with all these kind of scenarios. Don't let it turn into a them and us situation. The context is, there's a shed load of work, it needs to be done. Whoever is best placed to do it, just crack on and do it. If we have tools to allow us to do it better, welcome it. If we buy into this whole, it will replace your role and therefore we should shy away from it, that creates an adversarial environment which in turn allows people to do unto us because then all of a sudden we're considered blockers for people to bypass. If instead the approach is, do you know what? I'd quite like to do whatever I do to the best of my ability. Give us the tools to do it. That argument goes away. Then it's for us, plurally, within this room and without this room, with all the societies and the royal colleges, to get over ourselves a little bit, actually. Um, move beyond titles. Uh, and this is about the only time I'm going through this because I'm going to duck before someone throws a shoe at me. Um, and this <laughs> is where you as radiographers need to get over yourselves a little bit as well. Because the same arguments that are going back and forth about the role of a radiographer, reporters versus diagnostics, how you're going to do it, it's not very helpful. How can you complain about being excluded by software companies about your role mm. if it's not clear amongst yourselves what your roles are? Yeah, be proud of what you do. It's a noble um, tradition. Um, skill mix, um, extension of what you do. These are great things to embrace not to use a divisive tool amongst yourselves and then between radiographers and radiologists? I think the question should move from whether this is going to replace either radiographers or oh. radiologists, whether radiologists and radiographers will have a conflict in their professional roles. You will have to move on to the base that how can we use AI to make it better for healthcare and the patients? Because the people who are asking if they see themselves as patients in the future, they would like the best possible technology working synergistically between radiologists and radiographers and not fighting about professional roles and rights. I think we have discussed enough about this question and I think it's not relevant anymore. The important question is how we can better use it to improve professional practice, clinical practice, education and research. Just think, just think, right, practically. 
You're working in a department, you've just taken an x-ray, you're not sure about it. Is, it, is that a fracture, is that a, an infection? You're staring at it. What do, you, what do you do? You say to somebody, have a look at this with me. Two people then have a look at that. They haven't replaced you. It's, you know, it's just, I think it was three mentioned the, the, the other, the, pair, the next, sorry, the second pair of eyes. That's, so we should be embracing it and not fearing it. Justin? There's also a 10% increase in medical imaging examinations annually, which means we, we still have the shortage of radiologists, the shortage of radiographers. So AI actually is a necessity, particularly in this country. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't really worry at all about, about this. Justin? Okay, so my question is, do we need a more unified uh, national radiology approach to AI? And if so, who should own it? Uh, the reasoning behind that is that uh, the majority of the successful AI processes that you've shown tonight have been based on national data sets, large cohort data sets, and that's the, how they have succeeded. At the moment, AI is rolled out in small cohorts in separate hospitals, um, so we have to repeat the process of integrating and integrating and integrating. We don't actually develop beyond the local infrastructure. When you look more widely, you look at things like Path Lake Project, where they're already looking at creating central resource for data sets that will be valid across a nation rather than just a local demographic. I, I entirely agree with you, actually, because no point in developing in one corner and then we have to replicate the whole thing again. But this is what we try. We're, no, we're nowhere near uh, what you just said, actually, because I think someone should, uh, we sh as a profession should take the lead. Probably all the colleges should come together, all the societies should come together, RCR, BIR, uh, COR, and we should all come together with the industry and work together so that anything which is done is in, can be easily be implemented across the patch, not just in isolated areas. I fully agree. How do we do it? That's the biggest challenge. I fully agree. There's no easy solution to it, but I think we can make a start there. I mean, we discussed this in, in our uh, AI meeting, and in the next, uh, next meeting, we plan to have a session on this, actually. Uh, I mean, time, we can't wait till then, I know that, but we're making a start. Mm. I don't know about that. Anymore. I think I certainly agree it is to the colleges mm. to carry this initiative forward, and I think they need to bring together patients, academic experts, industry, uh, to discuss about the key priorities as a national framework for the future on AI. But I think definitely the the leadership of that national framework for AI lies with the colleges, and I think this is something they, I think this, this is something they should definitely carry forward, or if not already making plans for that, uh, because they are the policy influencers and the policy makers in the country. So we have lots and lots of these groups around the countries. We've already talked about NHS Digital and NHS X and the AI Lab. What's their reason for being if they're not going to be the leads in this kind of space? Um, if we talk about a factitious region which none of you will recognize, um, which will have perhaps more than one teaching hospital, which will have a number of DDHs, which are all probably doing um, AI trials, which they're not going to tell the neighbor about because they want to be the first to write about them. Mm -hmm. um, and so then when you little DDH do yours, you won't know that someone down the road is six months ahead and you don't share it. It's ridiculous. I completely agree with you. The simple answer to your question is yes. Um, what we should be doing is we should be more open in what we're doing. We should be sharing our knowledge. We should be sharing our methodology. Um, if you've done some work and you've realized that a particular solution is junk in your particular context, well, then you should be free to do about it to save me having to reinvent that wheel to realize I've wasted six months of my life realizing this piece of software is junk. And equally, if Nick has worked up a solution which has found out for this particular scenario, something is brilliant, why on earth can we not then clearly validate it for the patient cohort that we are using to make sure where it fits? Um, and we have, you know, let's say we had something called NHS AI, which you could share all these learnings into, and then it could say, well, you know what? We've already had this bit of information, so why don't you have it? We have a cohort of validated solutions which do X, Y, and Z. Um, the more sharing we have, the quicker we can move towards meaningful deployment. We don't. It's all cloak and daggers, and it's all egos still, unfortunately. Three little words of non-disclosure agreement. And then this is the problem of are we at a barrier between population health, which is what the NHS is. The NHS is a population level health service. It is done for the benefit of the whole population. 
but we're competing and with these uh, with people that are trying to take their corner of the market which isn't a population level result <coughs> charlotte thank you nick and i'd just like to thank all the speakers i think it's been a you know really interesting and thought-provoking evening and certainly from the professional body perspective we've obviously got a lot of work to do and kevin's alluded to that in terms of the education and career framework and again working with everybody else I think I just wanted to report back on a really positive conversation that we had last week with um, the Director of Innovation and Life Sciences at NHS Improvement. And a really positive uh, meeting to hear about the 140 million that's put forward for AI in, in diagnosis and screening, which is part of the 250 million pounds that you mentioned earlier. And I think that's not an insignificant sum, and it really inspired me to feel confident in the approach that NHS England were taking in NHS improvement in terms of setting together the right group of people, which included all of the professions, which included the MHRA, the NIHR, all the regulators, all the right people, it felt on the around the table, who will be evaluating the bids that are put in for this 140 million. And I suppose what's encouraging to me is it felt, and I probably shouldn't say this when I know there are people from NHS Improvement in the room, but actually it felt, I felt quite confident in the approach that was being taken with regard to this. It, there was going to be patient engagement, there were going to be full work streams, <coughs> and it was looking about how these bids would be then evaluated, tested, piloted, and then rolled out further with the support of the professionals in service in a really, I felt, measured way. I'm waiting for the notes from this meeting. I had hoped, I'd said to Foddy that I might give a little bit more information at the beginning. But it's just fair to say that as a professional body, we've been invited to be on that steering group with these key other bodies, obviously the Royal College, the IR, I suspect, um, <coughs> and all of those regulatory bodies and research um, organizations, which I guess is reflecting what we've said throughout the evening about the importance of collaboration and a joined up approach. So I, I did feel very confident and I don't know, if Fiona, if you've got anything to add to that, because I think you kindly created that introduction for us. And, it, uh, you know, that Sam Roberts, who's in charge of it, was hugely inspiring, and I felt confident in this approach that was being taken. I think, obviously, we're trying to join up the pieces of NHS England and NHS Improvement. Um, and um, I, I guess how what we're doing with imaging networks sits with that, is we're trying to develop imaging networks of six, ten trusts, recognizing that six or ten trusts have a data set um, that is probably about the right size to do some of this testing. We're also trying to get funding, obviously, to put the IT infrastructure in place for every network so that when some of the pilots and things that have been evaluated, you know, come out with positive findings, we've got the infrastructure nationally to roll that out rapidly. And um, we feel confident that each of the networks have, you know, are, are appropriate connected but it is quite challenging um, you know I won't lie we've NHS X you know X is still a little bit of an unknown quantity it's bits of, bits of what was NHS digital with bits of what was NHS England we've got the new innovation people coming forward we've got centers of excellence who are piloting uh, for imaging and Kings um, at Oxford collaborations um, so there's lots of activity and lots of different elements but hopefully you know that will start to come together i'm really delighted that that meeting was positive because uh, but uh, i mean i'm interested just i suppose now i've got the microphone i'm interested in the patient's <laughs> perspective in all of this um because I, I, my previous role i worked on 100,000 genomes and talked about informed consent um and the sort of touching the patient bit uh, really resonated to me and i just wonder how prepared we are as a profession when a patient asks us a question about AI, or will you know will my mammogram be read by a machine, or um, who's going to be looking at my chest X-ray? Uh, I think as a professional radiographer, we're at that interface, and we're going to have to be prepared to be able to have that conversation. It's a bit like you know when you do a repeat X-ray, and the patient says, "Oh, more radiation! Is that going to give me cancer?" Um, you know, you're going to we're going to have to be prepared as a profession to have actually some quite complex conversations with people uh, and to be able to explain things um, and make things accessible, but also to, um, to discuss quite challenging concepts. Um, certainly that was the case in genomics. And as we start to move into 
um, radio genomics, that gets into quite a complex area. So I think there's challenges in there for, for all of us. And um, we haven't heard much about the patient and the. I was about to say, Fiona, I think that's patient. great. So we are three minutes or four, we're now four minutes away. We've got one minute each on how the patients should be involved in this and how we can communicate. One minute each to the panel members to conclude. Thank you, Fiona. I mean, uh, we spoke about involving all the bodies, but we also involve the patient bodies as well in uh, um, preparing or developing these uh, um, algorithms. Because you're right, uh, patients should be at the center of all this. We're, we're doing this for, to uh, improve patient care. But uh, going back to NHSX, NHSX, they released this document only in October last year, which I showed you earlier. And one thing they said very clearly is we should give clarity to the patients on the strengths and limitations of these new software and algorithms. So anything which we implement in NHS after proper validation, I mean, they, we should make it very clear to the patients that all of these, uh, I mean, there are, there are bound to be some limitations for all these algorithms. So we should, they should be documented probably, which we can give the patients when they come into the hospital for an investigation, which uh, lists the strengths and limitations, and who's taking responsibility, and the ethical side of things. I don't know what, uh, whether Christina, you want to add on those things, but I think the ethical implications and uh, the responsibility is also very important uh, for all these new uh, AI <coughs> algorithms which are going to be implemented in the clinical practice in the near future. Um, for academia, the answer is very simple because it's already streamlined into our curriculum design and research. So the lady who sits next to you can explain much more. Patient public involvement is integral to every research project we're doing from the inception to the uh, deployment, implementation, and evaluation of every research project. So we need, we have people from patient groups discussing about projects, and the same accounts for AI research projects. In terms of education, for any new curricular designs, we have patient groups who discuss with us about what our students are learning, and they can feedback to us. So for academia, it's already part of the practice, and it's not a, a new concept for us. Uh, patient partnerships are embedded in the work that we do in the in the college, we've always done that. Um, much as it pains me to channel Donald Rumfeld, but hey, even a broken clock tells the correct time twice. Uh, okay, um, but if we go back to the unknowns, unknowns thing, um, it is clearly useful to get patient engagement in how they might see improvements in some of their pathways and how we might use um, AI to perhaps implement that better. Um, the counterpoint to that, I'd guess, is um, just as the patient doesn't usually know who's doing the operating, they don't certainly don't know who's actually reporting their examination. Um, when you get into this whole, what if they don't want the algorithm to report? Well, they don't know if it's reported at the moment by a consultant radiologist, a radiologist, SPR, a consultant, reporting radiographer, um, a trainee, the AI appropriately validated would just be one other type of reporter. I think we need to separate engagement to improve the pathways versus just perhaps saying things because it seems right that it's a nice thing to say without it particularly being useful of how we implement these solutions. Always like to leave on a controversial note. There's one. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, more importantly, thank you to Body Union Health for hosting such an informative, uh, interesting debate. Thank you to the panel and to the speakers, um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.